professor at Columbia University, where you run a lab focused on systems biology of aging. You were recently the lead author on the paper, Taurine Deficiency as a Driver of Aging. So welcome to Modern Healthspan, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, you are very welcome. So, uh, Dr. Yadav, kind of before we jump into the paper, the paper is very exciting. Um, a little background on kind of taurine. So why did you pick taurine as the molecule that you were going to study? So, um, well, we were not interested in taurine, to be honest. Um, we uh, were doing a metabolomic screen in humans, aged humans, uh, way back in 2011. Um, and then one of my uh, postdocs, uh, the senior postdoc, noted that many molecules were changing with age. <laughs> and uh, what she noted is that there is a molecule that was down-regulated in um, humans, in aged humans, uh, around 60-year-old humans. And that molecule was taurine. Well, she just came up to me and said, uh, do you know what taurine is? And I really, at that point, I said, I have no clue. Uh, mm -hmm. I have heard about the name, but I don't know what it is and what does it do? Let us find out. Um, let's do some investigations. And uh, in the process of next few months, uh, in 2011, we realized that um, taurine is not a new molecule, first of all. Uh, it was identified way back in 1827 in Oxbile. And... This uh, made us curious uh, what this molecule is. And for almost 140 years, uh, nobody cared about taurine because um, biochemistry and molecular biology was evolving in during that period. Uh, so people didn't know uh, about this molecule. And in 1950s, uh, affluence in society increased after World War II. People became rich and um, they needed uh, a uh, pet diet to give it to their pets because they were having nine to five jobs. And this led to a increased demand for pet foods and uh, pet food industry responded very well. They provided these pellets which can be given to pets. You go to office in the morning, you put these pellets in a bowl, cats and dogs ate them. And uh, when you come back in the evening, they, they are full so that you don't uh, worry about them. This introduction of pet foods in the society led to increased incidence of variety of diseases in pets, such as uh, cardiovascular abnormalities and uh, growth defects. One of the most striking aspects of this entire episode was that cats started turning blind. They were visibly blind, they were hitting walls, they were dropping vase in the houses. So this was very distressful sign uh, for mm -hmm. pet owners. I think you can imagine uh, a rich household having a cat going blind and not able to grow. And this increased the interest in the society to fund research to find out why the cats are visibly growth retarded and blind. It took scientists around 20, 25 years to figure out why. So from 1950s, people started working on it. And 1975, there was a seminal paper published in Science that showed that blindness or retinal degeneration in cats is caused by a specific molecule deficiency in their diets. And one molecule only, and that molecule was taurine. Mm -hmm. So after that, the cat food was supplemented with taurine and the blindness went away overall. Um, 15, 20 years later, there was another study published in Science again, 1987, that showed that cardiac failure or uh, cardiac abnormalities in cats is also caused by deficiency of taurine in their diets. So these two studies, I, in my view, along with other studies, provided impetus and increased interest in the, in the scientific world as well as in the society uh, regarding what taurine is and what does it do in health. And since then, taurine has been shown to be associated with a variety of health parameters. Um, it regulates uh, sugar uh, metabolism. It regulates uh, fat metabolism. It regulates uh, cognitive functions. It can act as a, as a uh, neural growth promoter and muscle functions. So these studies were an indication that taurine is doing something important. 
Um, but at this point, when we were starting to investigate this molecule, it was not known what happens to taurine metabolism during aging and does it affect the aging process. And that is where we started investigation of uh, the role of taurine in the aging process. So what do we know about the decrease? Do we, do we have kind of intermediate steps for when it go, starts going down? And, and also so, it's across different mammals, right? Yeah. yeah so that is an important question uh, because variety of uh, different animal species, um, many most eukaryotes have taurine. And very abundant amounts is one of the most abundant molecule present in the body. In many tissues, it is present in milligram quantities and far beyond any amino acid. And we don't know at the present time, when does the level start declining? Because if one looks at the entire life cycle of a mammal, let us focus on mammals here, uh, like us. So entire cycle of mammal in the species um, first of all, some mammals have a deficiency of taurine because they cannot produce it at all, such as cats. They are defective in the enzyme that regulates the production of taurine. So they cannot produce it. Other species such as humans, for example, let us come to mam uh, higher uh, mammalian species such as humans. In humans, when a child is born, they cannot produce it. And that is why in the human uh, formula milk uh, or formula, uh, these baby diets have been supplemented with taurine for a very long period of time now. Now, as we grow, uh, we start having some ability to synthesize taurine to a limited amount. And that is why this molecule is defined as a semi-essential nutrient. In the early part of life, it is essential. And this also brings me back to the decline question that you asked. It so happens that embryonic tissues during gestation in variety of mammalian species have five to tenfold higher taurine levels. Hmm. Now, as soon as child is born, now it is out of the mother's womb. Mother is not able to provide taurine through placenta. Now it comes down dramatically. Five to ten fold, you can imagine, in the during gestation, comes down to when child is born and then starts some production because it is an important nutrient. We do not know. That is why I said we do not know at the present time when does it decline. Is it at birth and then uh, goes down further when you are 60 year old? I don't know the answer to that. And we are investigating aggressively this question. And this, this is an important question in my view because uh, this also will elucidate um, the landscape of taurine metabolism in humans across the life cycle. And we are looking at making a, at the present time a whole, borg, or whole body atlas of uh, taurine metabolism. How does it change during um, the not only aging process, but as well as from development to the aging process? And this is the question, an important question. We, we are trying to, our best to investigate, and I hope it does not take 10 years more. Right. So at the moment, so for an adult, do we get most of our taurine by making it internally or most from our diet? Or do we know? Both. Both. Uh, at the present time, I think it is both. Um, in the adult life, we have uh, a limited, as I said, limited capacity to synthesize taurine. And uh, different diets uh, or dietary composition in humans have evolved uh, during the course of evolution to shape our metabolism accordingly. So humans, uh, meaning basically we, we came out of Africa a long, long time ago. And we diverse to different locations uh, in the world. Uh, we, some of us remained... Um, dependent on uh, non-vegetarian products and some of the the uh, ethnic groups uh, started developing more agriculture and they have more grain uh, based diets milk eggs and, and things like that so at the present time we are trying to understand how these evolutionary divergence in the society led to shaping the taurine metabolism uh, in different ethnic groups. And that is the question we will address before we jump onto the clinical trial across uh, different populations. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. What are the precursors to Turing? So what, what does it get created out of? So, well, uh, so far, it is known, and as I say, so far, because in biology, you are not definite, uh, never there, <laughs> you are, uh, yeah. cysteine. Cysteine is one of the precursor of taurine uh, biosynthesis, a sulfur amino acid. And that is because it has a sulfonyl group, it is not incorporated into proteins. Because for to be incorporated into proteins, you need a carboxyl group. And this sulfur containing amino, amino acid is derived um, from cysteine in the cells, primarily liver, actually. Uh, liver is the primary producer of taurine. And that also uh, emphasizes the importance of liver uh, in the mammalian physiology. It's, it's a very important organ.